meeting to order. Welcome to meeting number three of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans. The committee is meeting to discuss committee business. Or witnesses, hear from witnesses. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format. I would like to start the meeting by providing you with some of the following information, the motion that was and the motion that was adopted in the House on Wednesday, September twenty third, twenty twenty. The committee is now sitting in a hybrid format, meaning that members can participate either in person or by video conference. Witnesses must appear by video conference. All members, regardless of their method of participation, will be counted for the purpose of quorum. The committee's power to sit is, however, limited by the priority use of House resources, which is determined by the WHIPs. All questions must be decided by a recorded vote unless the committee disposes of them with unanimous consent or on division. And finally, the committee may deliberate in camera provided that it takes into account the potential risk to confidentiality inherent to such deliberations with remote participants. The proceedings will be made available via the House of Commons website, so you are aware the webcast will always show the person speaking rather than the entirety of the committee. To ensure an orderly meeting, I would like to outline a few rules for everyone to follow. For those participating virtually, members and witnesses may speak in the official language of their choice. Interpretation services are available for this meeting. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor, English or French. Before speaking, click on the microphone icon to activate your own mic. When you are done speaking, please put your mic on mute to minimize any interference for other speakers. A reminder that all comments by members and witnesses should be addressed through the chair. Should members need to request the floor outside of their designated time for questions, they should activate their mic and state that they have a point of order. If a member wishes to intervene on a point of order that has been raised by another member, they should use the raised hand function. This will signal to the chair that you're of your interest to speak and create a speakers list. In order to do so, you should click on participants at the bottom of your screen. When the list pops up, you will see next to your name that you can click raised hand. When speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. Unless there are exceptional circumstances, the use of headsets with a boom microphone is mandatory for everyone participating remotely. Should any technical challenges arise, please to ensure all members are able to participate fully. For those participating in person, which I don't think we have any this evening, so I won't read out those rules. With regard to a speaking list, the committee clerk and I will do the best we can to maintain consolidated order of speaking for all members, whether they are participating virtually or in person. I would now, of course, like to welcome our witnesses for the first uh, session of our meeting this evening. In the first panel, we have Shelley Denny appearing as an individual. And as well, of course, we have uh, Alison Bernard, Wildlife Le Lead with Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. We, will, we, we have reached out to others this evening, of course, to get uh, a full slate of witnesses, but uh, we just it was on short notice and we just wanted to get this study started. We will now proceed with opening remarks. Ms. Denny, it will go to you first for six minutes or less, please. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the invitation to stand in front of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans as you undertake your study implementation of Mi'kmaq fishing rights to support a moderate livelihood. I'm Mi'kmaq myself who has membership with Budaladek First Nation, but I've lived in Eskasoni for some time now. I'm a doctoral student in the Marine Affairs Program at Dalhousie University, seeking solutions to the same issues facing the committee. How can we successfully implement Mi'kmaq inherent and treated fisheries in Nova Scotia? I was fortunate to be part of a participatory research project funded by the Social Sciences and Human Humanities Research Council, uh, known as FISHWEX, which is an acronym for Fisheries Western and Indigenous Knowledge Systems. Here, our goal is to use both knowledge systems to seek solutions to improve fisheries governance on all three of Canada's coasts. My role as a doctoral researcher in the Atlantic region was to identify and conduct research that is needed to solve a current fisheries governance issue facing Indigenous communities, and also to explore solutions through the lens of both knowledge systems referred to as two white seeing. In two white seeing, the knowledge is viewed as a system where knowledge is not only what is known, but rather how it is known. 
But a knowledge system, whether it is Western or Indigenous, is comprised of many things. What we know, how we practice our knowledge, how we adapt to it, and how we transmit and share knowledge are the elements most people are familiar with. But the values and the underlying beliefs that underpin these elements and which actually distinguish one knowledge system from a problematic because often the values and beliefs underpinning one system are at odds with another, potentially creating a barrier to collaboration. However, our research in the Fishwicks project have shown that there are also similarities that can be used to start building bridges across knowledge systems and to help with developing a greater understanding of the differences. This means that it's critical for those coming from different knowledge systems to understand the values and beliefs driving each system for all parties involved in finding solutions. Take these into consideration when developing a path forward. While much of the research has shown that deep core beliefs are non-negotiable, many values, for example, fairness, tend to be more shared across knowledge systems and as such are more easily understood in the efforts to resolve conflicts. Today, we'd like to share some of my research outcomes that can help enhance your understanding of the situation. It's unfortunate the what of moderate livelihood takes over discussions because it is the how Mi'kmaq treaty-based governance, treaty-based fisheries can be implemented is the crux of the issue. Between 2018 and 2019, I conducted 48 interviews with 52 individuals experienced in fisheries governance, history, fishing, and law. Today, I would like to share the key challenges uncovered during my research. I'm sure the challenges will sound familiar, but they're supported through research. It is no surprise that conflicting relations are at the core of the current tensions. Reasons underpinning conflicting relations were continued antagonistic behavior towards Mi'kmaq fishers, a lack of trust externally and internally, the lack of understanding of the Mi'kmaq context and competition for resources. There are numerous gaps contributing to the situation we have today. For example, there is no federal policy to address livelihood fisheries. Furthermore, government needs, government needs to better develop its capacity to address Mi'kmaq rights, which is currently inadequate. They're being more reactive than proactive, and in general, things move slowly in government. The industry values rules and are concerned about how how industry rules don't apply to Indigenous fishing and fisheries and perceive Indigenous fishers to be operating in a legal vacuum. Mi'kmaq want to support their families through livelihood fishing, but there are no avenues to do so. Negotiations are nation to nation, but mostly without the inclusion of the fishers who are affected. While all Mi'kmaq have rights, not all Mi'kmaq are interested in pursuing livelihood fishing. Identify those who want to fish as part of the process. Governance gaps exist at the community level as well and are a concern to the DFO. Conflicting views of authority to manage fisheries are evident. This is related to perceptions of legitimacy of the governing systems. Legitimacy is how a political action is perceived as right and just by the various people who are involved, interested, or affected by it. There are challenges on both sides for the perception of Mi'kmaq fishers value the continuation of their cultural practices and connection of their exercise of Mi'kmaq rights to their identity and recognition of the treaties. In their eyes, they don't need a license to fish. They have their treaties and their authorization. authorization comes from their birthright. For the DFO, governing based on cultural teachings passed down through families doesn't fit their top-down approach, top-down highly regulated approach to fisheries. However, a shared perspective is a lack of an alternative to current fisheries governance. The Mi'kmaq are aware that there are challenges with the exercise of rights, including the abuse of rights, and need ways to address them that are culturally appropriate as they evolve ethical issues that cannot be addressed by DFO or the Canadian legal system. It is a necessity for the Mi'kmaq to develop fishery and fishing rules. Moving forward, we need to recognize that this is not only an operational nightmare for DFO. This is a governance issue that requires making room for the Mi'kmaq through the principle of sharing. The industry needs to make room for Mi'kmaq livelihood fisheries by sharing access to resources. DFO needs to make room for an alternate governance model that is consistent with the treaties and Canadian law by sharing authority and decision-making and ultimately facilitating a legal framework to allow for the persistence of an alternative fisheries governance model. It is evident that DFO's capacity to govern Mi'kmaq fisheries is limited given the protection of Aboriginal treaty rights in Canada's constitution. But the important point and the opportunity that is overlooked is the willingness and desire of the Mi'kmaq to contribute to fisheries governance. Let's take that opportunity to use shared values of governance to explore how they can coexist and employ innovation to address values that are unique to each perspective. Now that we understand that the underlying reasons for conflicting relations, we need to be aware that our actions must build trust through good governance principles, encourage treaty education, and minimize competition between fishers and fisheries. Thank you, Lalio. Thank you for that. We'll now go to Mr. Bernard for five minutes or less, please. You're on mute. Hi, um, my name is Alison Bernard, and um, I'm employed with the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. 
I've been involved on the fishery file for the last 10 years, really. Um, I've seen a lot of ups and downs and seen two different governments try to pursue this. Anyway, um, my experience in this has been somewhat uh, concerning a lot of times because, you know, we see, I see to move ahead. Even though that we had this um, treaty right or the this Marshall decision since um, 1999, which is 21 years, um, you know, it, it certainly brings a heartfelt feeling because my father was a chief for a community when this came through and, um, you know, everybody thought that you would go out there fishing and uh, go on with your lives. But uh, in any case, that didn't happen. So there's been a lot of talk uh, on both sides between uh, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs and government, uh, DFO, right up to the minister's office. Um, and, um, you know, it is steady, but uh, progress wasn't really made. So the Mi'kmaq, this is uh, somewhat like the third generation moving in into the Marshall decision. My father was, like I said, was the initial person. I'm the second in generation. Um, I was a bank counselor, as I said, for about 10 years. And now my, my son is out there fishing. Uh, and he's having a, a really hard time because... You know, there's inconsistency uh, with whatever is happening out there. Our, our people are, are told by our own that, you know, we do have a right and the courts uh, recognize that right. But, you know, being a part of this whole scenario, what's been unfolding the last many weeks, I was in the dead center of uh, Sonyaville, uh, Southwest Nova, where all the, the protests were happening and uh, between the Acadian fishermen or the area fishermen and the Mi'kmaq. It's really hard to look at your own people, especially the youth that would, that were so excited going out there and industry coming in and destroying traps, uh, cutting gear, taking traps and chasing boats out of the water to a point where as a, an ex-police officer knowing what's going on out there, you know, there should have been measurements and uh, activities by either DFO or the RCMP uh, to prevent such uh, uh, dis distasteful, I guess, activities by uh, angry mobs and fishermen. Um, we do practice our livelihood fishery, and we have been practicing for thousands of years under the concept of nadugulim. Nadugulim only is a very strong word in our culture. Uh, it doesn't... Uh, it limits activities and it certainly puts you to a point where you respect everything in the ocean and everything around you, including plants, birds, air, water, everything around you. So we don't disrupt anything. But in any case, um, you know, I, I was really happy that I was invited to this uh, tonight because uh, I've seen a lot in my days and um, I think there needs to be something done between the consistency of DFO also when it comes to relation of CNP and the regular management of uh, uh, DFO. There seems to be uh, in, they're not collaborating, in my opinion, to what's going on in region to region. Uh, as I said, uh, there's been more seizures of traps uh, in St. Peter's Bay over the last few days, and uh, CNP has actually said that you know, they haven't got any word from Ottawa or the minister's office that they're not prevented. They, they should not uh, seize any gear. So the only gear that's left out there is for our food fishery, and that's uh, food social ceremonial stuff. But um, as we move forward, um, I've been, uh, like I said, I, I was a part of a lot of actions taking place right now, and um, Everything's moving along well. There was a, a quiet protest today by the, the Mi'kmaq fishery, fisher, fishery Committee, I guess, or people that support our, our youth fishers that are out there. And when I say youth, I have to say youth because this is, again, the third generation of people because I'm not able to go fishing. Uh, so it's my sons that are out there. But the inconsistency of uh, my, my opinion is through DFO and... Um, how they convene and conduct themselves, uh, whether it's CMP or whether it's a minister's office, uh, that has to change. But uh, as I said, I've, I've been involved in the moderate livelihood issue over the last many years, but I've also been involved in consultation side of everything. 
So I've seen, I, I see everything, how everything is connected, um, whether it's conservation and uh, food, social, or industry. Um, it's really disheartening that, you know, a group of people, uh, all Nova Scotians that seem not to be able to get along and find answer to answers to a situation where there's clearly enough people, smart, uh, smart enough people within industry and in the Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaq governance system. You know, we have to be recognized. And um, when we assert our rights, we do have a governance structure. We are the third level of government in Nova Scotia. We have the provincial, we have the Mi'kmaq, and we have the federal departments. So which the Mi'kmaq in itself, hereditary rights of actually uh, to implement their own governance structures have been uh, ignored over the last many years. And it took, and it took the, the last month that, you know, the Mi'kmaq, uh, said, you know, enough is enough. We have to um, do what's right for our people and we have to go fishing. Um, okay, Mr. Bernard, we're, we're out of time for the opening statement. Uh, anything you haven't had a chance to get out, hopefully we'll come out into questioning or you can certainly submit your speaking notes to the clerk of the committee. Uh, we'll go now to our questioning and first on our list for six minutes or less, Mr. Bragdon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both uh, Ms. Denny and uh, Mr. Bernard for your taking the time and being here this evening on such short notice and discussing this very, very important uh, situation that is before us right now. And uh, I just want to simply express our appreciation for you taking the time to come before committee. And, and say thank you for that. And we appreciate your insights and look forward to hearing more from you as we work through this. Obviously, we, we've arrived in this situation. Um, I don't think this is something that happened overnight. This has been, it seems like, uh, a, a situation that has been uh, percolating for some time and it seems to have escalated most recently to where we are in the current circumstance. And I think it's so important for all Canadians and for all of us to make sure we get this right and that we do it right. And is without question and very well established uh, the Indigenous rights to fish and to have fishery. And we want to make sure those rights are upheld and uh, certainly able to be carried out. And we also understand that for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, fisheries that the conservation of the species is very very important for all sectors because we want uh, there to be lots of uh, lobster and fish and and species and stock in the oceans for all future generations for both indigenous and non-indigenous to enjoy and to make livelihood from and so i i appreciate you being here at the table this evening and uh, i'd like to start off by asking both of you uh, as you've seen this situation unfold most recently and build to where it's at. Um, it appears very much that there's been in large part an inaction on the part of the government and on the part of the minister as it relates to the situation in Nova Scotia. I would ask uh, both of you what your thoughts would be towards uh, well, what the government's response has been and the minister's response in particular to this situation thus far. Uh, do you want me to go ahead, Shelley? Sure. Yeah, um, I find it really disheartening because as I look uh, and participated in, in stuff in Sonyaville, I went there as a somewhat of a peacekeeper, really, because I knew tensions would rise. And uh, the inactive behavior of DFO not going out there in, in the water and doing what they were supposed to do um, resonates uh, that really Mi'kmaq people don't care about Mi'kmaq or government doesn't really care about Mi'kmaq. I've witnessed uh, the minister make statements uh, over the last couple months where industry have uh, rallied and protested uh, in front of her office. And I know it's not an easy task to take and I, and I certainly feel for her because I, being a, a former politician myself and being involved in politics all my life, you can't please everybody. 
But one thing that you have to be careful of, you know, when you talk about infringing Aboriginal rights and what we have in treaties, you know, they're protected. Of that. They should be protected under agency that's out there. And that just didn't happen. Instead, uh, industry got their way and it was very, very disheartening and uh, really fearful, in my opinion, because uh, as I said, I was an ex-police officer to witness all the injustices taking place in the water. Um, it was like a war zone and we were all praying that, you know, nobody would get hurt, but the, bo the boats themselves really came close to uh, ramming uh, individual Mi'kmaq boats that were really smaller uh, in comparison to the size of vessels that were out there. Um, the minister, in my opinion, didn't act properly. Um, she should have made a bold statement there. Uh, instead, you know, the statements were made after riots and stuff uh, took place. Um, but it could have very easily led to a, a confrontation where actually when a couple of times when the, the two nations got together, uh, between the Mi'kmaq and the non-native uh, fishermen. Uh, at one point, I had to stand in between. I mean, uh, along with an ex-police officer um, from the area, from Sebek Negative, uh, we actually had to convince our people not to uh, take uh, things into their own hands. We prevented a lot of violence from happening a couple times. And But, you know, looking in, it's really... A, it hurts uh, an individual knowing that, you know, you, and uh, you know that you have the treaty right to do what you, you're supposed to be doing. You should be protected. As I said, uh, you're sworn as an officer to protect uh, the Constitution of Canada under whatever regulations, whether it's the RCMP Act or the Fisheries Act. But at the end of the day, the Constitution is the Constitution as a country. And for a government not to act upon what, what they see was really hurtful. And uh, I'm just glad nobody got killed over there. And okay, thank, 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 you. thank you, Mr. Bernard. Thank uh, you, Mr. Bernard. That questioning uh, time allotted for Mr. Bragdon has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Batiste for six minutes or less, please. Um, my question is uh, to, to Shelley Denny, who uh, can you tell us, you know, there's a lot of been uh, discussed about conservation and uh, that there's seasons for a reason. And that because of that, there's no room for the Mi'kmaq within the, the lobster fishery. Can you tell me what your thoughts are on that and some of the solutions that you uh, came up with in your article that you, your editorial in the Chronicle Herald? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Jaime. Um, there are reasons for the season, but most of them are around the market conditions. So Canada prefers to sell the hard shell lobster. Um, there is a reproductive um, season as well for lobster. Um, it's not a mass spawning event, so there is time needed for lobsters to seek out mates to um, to protect them, to to wait for the the molt, which is the, the shedding of the external skeleton, and also for the the shell to harden back up again. So that takes a bit of time. Um, but also too, I, I think there's a lot. Uh, a lot has to do with the sea and ice conditions too. So not everyone has the same opportunities to go out all the time um, based on on the on sea and ice conditions. The Bay of Fundy is a different place because there's never really any sea and ice, sea ice conditions. Uh, the tides are so high that it just come in and back out again. Um, so when they're talking about conservation, it's it's really hard to to justify seasons. Uh, for a reason, you know, when you look across Atlantic Canada, even when you're looking at Nova Scotia, for example, in the Gulf, there is one lobster fishing area, um, LFA 25, that actually fishes during August to October. So while fishing was happening in LFA 39, in 25, there's also a commercial fishery happening. So it's really hard to justify consistency in, in, in um, seasons when they vary um, across Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. Um, you know, there's the, you know, making room for being my is, you know, you, you do need to share access. Uh, if conservation is an opportunities to have a, a larger voice in what happens in the, uh, the fishery. So they can, suggest, um, you know, when, the, when COVID happened that they were presented with an alternative to select a different season or to split season. So you kind of, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense to, to, um, to use the reason 
for the season as uh, justification for conservation. But I think there's other other ways that you know that Mi'kmaq could be um, in the fishery that um, you need to be innovative. And I think the industry has a lot of opportunities to make that happen. DFO does too, but we'd like to see it come from the industry because it's more empowering and it shows that capacity for sharing. And it's not a typical top-down approach where, where people felt like they got their traps, uh, trap numbers cut or, or anything like that, right? So it's, a, it's about, you know, recognizing their belief that conservation was, um, was targeted and then, but also to be able to provide some avenues for solutions. So can you expand on some of the simple solutions that you put in your article on uh, how you feel Mi'kmaq could be accommodated in their rights within the current seasons? Well, and that, and that was something that uh, was coming from the, the Marshall decisions, the second one. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, as, as Mi'kmaq people, you're limited to what you can make in the industry. Um, but at the same time, you can achieve those goals by fishing differently, uh, fishing less traps. There's other there's other ways to look at it, right? You don't have to fish uh, exactly one license. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconception about how many Mi'kmaq fishers are actually out there. So our communities need to find out how many people are interested. Right now, if we're starting to count the traps, um, I honestly don't have a number um, at the moment. Um, but you know, there I think there's there's room if every uh, lobster fisher gave up 1%. They were actually let go into a, a pot of some sort that has flexibility in how um, access is, is measured and determined, right? So um, I think that that's something that's simple and easy. It basically wouldn't cost. Um, and how many of traps would anything. that be in total? Oh, well, there's over 3,000 licenses. Well, actually, I had somebody um, correct me and told me there's over 9,000 licenses in Nova Scotia. So um, I'm not sure how that number got got calculated, but from my calculations in um, the Maritimes region alone, there are over 3,000, um, but that's including New Brunswick as well too, right? So there are, there are quite a few. So, you know, 1% of, um, of uh, 3,000 traps, I think at... Uh, two to two and a half to four, depending on where you are. That's, that's you know, over 8,000 traps. Um, the equivalent would be, you know, and, and people aren't really thinking like a one license per one license that doesn't work. It doesn't allow for the flexibility of Mi'kmaq people to fish in the Mi'kmaq way. Um, but having that opportunity to have access to something is, is really important. And that's first and foremost, especially when you're considering conservation and ways to protect conservation. Okay, can you give us a sense of uh, what Mi'kmaq Indigenous knowledge teaches us about conservation? Yes, definitely. I mean, Allison had, had mentioned previously about the Nedigalimk, and it's, it's, you know, it's a way of life that Mi'kmaq people have. So when you're trying to operationalize Nedigalimk, uh, there are certain things that I've, I've learned over the years, and not just through research, but also through my, um, my position here at UINR, is that it's it's a take what you need thing. So it's a self-limiting element to Nedigalimp. Um, there's also that ability to prevent waste um, and also the spiritual um, components and ceremonial components, such as making sure that you're able to share and also to give back. So there is that inclusion of, of ceremony in, in that concept. So in the last question, with your work with UINR, have you been able to manage any kind of stocks of any species collaboratively in, with the government? Yes, we have. So we have um, worked with uh, DFO for salmon. Um, and that was a, a bit of a process that started with consultation. Um, and it took a while to really understand that even though we had similar values of conservation, we realized there are different ways to get there. So, um, you know, a few years in the process when we, we start to figure out and map out actually uh, Mi'kmaq knowledge and, and DFO knowledge and, and how we can move forward, we ended up having to agree to disagree, but also recognize that if we stayed within, you know, a certain limit, a certain rate of exploitation, they were comfortable with it. We felt that we weren't um, actually uh, harvesting that exploitation level. We were never, we weren't anywhere near close to that level that we were all comfortable in, in how we could go forward. But there are right. things that thank, we have to thank do. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ms. Denny, and thank you, Mr. Batiste. Uh, we now go on to Madame Gill for six minutes or less, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I would like to thank our two witnesses. Of course, I will have questions for both. I would like to thank Ms. Denny for the quality of her testimony. I will have 
many questions, or I would have many questions to ask you, but I will limit myself to a few on conservation. I would also like to speak about another topic that interests all of us, of course, which is moderate livelihood. I'd like to hear you talk more about this, especially your perception or your idea of the way in which the competent authorities should define the concept, both when it regards quantity and the definition itself, the, the quality of that moderate livelihood. And the same question to Mr. Bernard, please. Thank you. I'll go first, Al. Is that okay? Um, with regards to moderate livelihood, you know, there is there is a concept. It's, it's not really about a definition. And that's unfortunately what takes over discussion. You know, and until you have a process where people can actually work together to drive that that concept i hate to call it a definition because a definition is limiting and and this a livelihood concept is about the ability to support oneself spiritually culturally um economically socially so it's 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 more than making money to people and i think that's something that's missing in you know people's concept of what a moderate livelihood is it yes sure you, you can make money but there are more things to, to consider and and i think that defining it will will um will limit it. Um, and then once you limit it, we're really not sure how you can achieve it. Um, I think it's more important to figure out how you can actually um, govern and work together to um, govern a livelihood fishery more than it is to put a definition to the term moderate livelihood. Thank you. Monsieur Bernard. Mr. Bernard, would you like to add something else? Or he can tell me a little about his own perception or his own idea of the situation. Um, I, I heard everything all in French and I really didn't understand. <laughs> um, if it's a uh, moderate livelihood. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, as Shelley was saying, um, you can't really define a moderate livelihood um, because it's been our way of life uh, for the last many thousands of years and times have changed. And so have our responsibilities and so have the needs of the Mi'kmaq people. As everybody knows, uh, I live in a community that's uh, severely pov poverty rates are up to 75% of our community. Uh, we have a high hum, um, uh, suicide rates, a lot of social problems that we do have. Um, our community is basically 75, 80% um, on social assistance. So, you know, when you see youth walking around that really don't have any future in sight uh, or anything that they might be able to look forward to, it's really disheartening. So. You know, this, when this came around and when we all decided that the, the Mi'kmaq were going to go fishing, you know, Eskizoni did their management plan and uh, Chapel Island did their management plan and so did Sebeg Negri. It was really encouraging that you saw these youths, you know, be happy for once, really, um, and manage you know, to get some self of uh, respect because uh, they just didn't have that. And now that they do have some sort of... Uh, future that they can look upon uh, and make truly hard drain wrenching when you when you witness that because this was available for them it's it's, it's a birthright being have, having that treaty and those treaties uh sanctified in, uh, under, under the constitution of canada and what really got me is why canada re didn't really uh approve them or didn't support them in their agencies with between dfo and other levels so, you know, um, being able to see that and also seeing the bad side of everything right now, um, people that really can't afford to buy traps uh, have been seized over the last few days. So they're asking, what do we do now? Because our, our neighbors and industry are pushing suppliers 
uh, with bait and licenses and other fish product fish products that we might need to accomplish our fishery are not being sold because uh, industry has placed pressures on them. So, but the, the tides are turning, you know, uh, you know, Montreal, as I saw some statements made that the restaurants don't want a lobster because of the dispute in Halifax areas. But, you know, in moving forward, I think there is a way. Um, I'll mention that, you know, every, our lobster fishery gets an extra 25 tags uh, per license in, in Nova Scotia. So in Southwest Nova, they operate 375 traps, but they also get an extra 50 traps per license holder. That equates up to 50,000 traps alone. The Mi'kmaq wouldn't be able to use 50,000 traps, you know, in that area, let alone in Nova Scotia. I, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of room there that could be played with and could be utilized, but there has to be uh, a give and take a little bit. Because at a, you know, at the end of the day, we do have the right. We don't have a privilege. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Uh, uh, that's all the time for Madam Gill's questioning. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Johns for six minutes or less, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm joining you from the unceded traditional territory of the Hoopachusset and Sashat uh, people. And I just want to thank you, Ms. Denny and Mr. Bernard, for your your uh, your witness testimony today. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bernard, I'm going to ask you a question uh, around the principles of uh, the Sepagan, uh, Sepagan Agony um, uh, rights implementation lobster fishery ma management plan that you cited uh, earlier. Ms. Denny talked about the traditional Mi'kmaq principle of uh, Nedugalam. And, uh, you know, that the goal is to achieve adequate standards of community nutrition and economic well-being without jeopardizing the integrity, diversity, or productivity of the environment. Do you support uh, Sepag and Agati in its uh, autonomous position to manage its fishery with this conservation principle? Uh, yes, I do, uh, 100%. I support any nation uh, in Nova Scotia being, or in New Brunswick or the Maritimes that want to do their own management plan under the terms and conditions of Nedugulink. Nedugulink is a very strong word. I started hearing this when I was a youth, uh, living with my grandfather, uh, because he was a single fella living alone, and I, I moved into his house. He was a very, uh, they both taught me how to hunt and not to take more than uh, what I do need uh, for our people and our tables. And that goes for fishing also. I never brought home uh, a bag full of fish or a, a bag full of lobster. And any time that I did, uh, I would be put to the road saying, you you go serve your neighbors and your family and others around our neighborhood. Give give all that stuff away because they will need it. Uh, the concept of Nadugalink is, is so far entrenched that when I'm doing yard work around my house, that I won't even take certain, I won't cut certain trees or stuff that I don't have to because it's not bothering me. This is Mother Nature's gift to us. We have plants, medicines everywhere that we've all lived in, in accordance and harmony for thousands of years. Um, that concept is uh, entrenched in who you are and what you are. Uh, we will be the first ones to fight and battle, as Shelley said, uh, when we were talking about salmon, we developed that plan. And, but even though we're entitled to take uh, probably over 500 salmon from rivers in, in our area, we don't. We probably take maybe 30 or 40, uh, if that, um, during the fall season. Uh, and that's not much. Um, we don't uh, go and do stuff that might hurt uh, species like the cod were. You know, if, we, if everybody practiced uh, the concept of nedugulink, we'd still have codfish coming out of our shores, and we don't have that. We've had species like herring that used to turn our waters white in Crane Cove where I live. That doesn't happen anymore. There's, there's no ground fish in the Verdor Lakes. Uh, there's hardly any lobster because of overfishing. Now, if everybody practiced Nedugulim, you know, Nedugulim couldn't even give you those 50 tags. You know, our communities would laugh at you if you had 200, 300 tags and you were asking for replacement tags upwards of up to 50. 
And that 50 alone, as I said, I'll go back to it, as equates to 50,000 traps. Right. So all of these things that are taking place, we are nature's conservationists. We are the, the only life that they do have. As I respect to the elder, Albert Marshall, uh, who is a neighbor of mine, has always said, you know, you have to speak on behalf of the species because they can't speak for themselves. So it's on us to protect everything out there. And I think if it goes down and it boils down to industry fight, then we'll, we'll have that fight. I, I really that. appreciate your, your Indigenous knowledge and your connection and bringing us to that place through sharing the, the principles and the interpretation of that. I have a question. Um, can you think of any rationale, any way that you can justify cutting traps, cutting nets, destruction of lobster as a way to um, justify con in, the, in the name of conservation? Can you think of any scenario that could justify those acts? in a way to support conservation? Oh my God, I mean, that is such a, an absurd uh, reason for trying to protect species or conservation, especially when you know yourself that you do have 50,000 extra taps out there at any given season, any given year. You know, um, I it's vandalism. It's taken away from people that are really impoverished, uh, that are working these boats that barely can afford to buy those traps in their, in their anything that would actually help conservation there. If anything, they're going to destroy it because they've left garbage under the sea uh, everywhere. I've, I've only got like 30 seconds left. I just want to ask you, do you support uh, the, the uh, Sepag and Agadee in their asserting their Section 35 constitutional rights to self-govern themselves with their rights implementation lobster fishery management plan? Uh, yes, I do wholeheartedly because I think uh, First Nations are the best uh, resource people ever. We've been here for thousands and we've shown the world and everybody around it that we do protect our our. Uh, our mother nature and everything that involved in, in this world, really. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Johns. Your, your time is up. I know we've gotten through a full round of questioning for each party, and I know we were a bit late starting due to some difficulties getting off early. Uh, but if we could, I would suggest if we can do another round, I have probably two and a half minutes to each party. If everyone is in agreement to that, and then we may have to go a few minutes late. I'm not seeing any objection. Okay, we'll continue on now to Mr. Arnold for two and a half minutes, please, or less. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to Ms. Denny and, and Mr. Bernard for being uh, with us today. Uh, when I see what's happening in Nova Scotia, it, it troubles me greatly. And I have to think back to a few years back when I was uh, president of the BC Wildlife Federation and we had conflict on the Fraser River over salmon fishing. And there was a meeting scheduled to try and bring the different parties together to discuss the different activities that were taking place to understand each other's uh, positions better. The day that that meeting was supposed to take place, there was a conflict on the river and one of the First Nations chiefs was hit in the cheek with a pellet from a pellet gun. Luckily, there were no serious injuries, but because of the incident, um, the, the meeting that was supposed to be held uh, being hosted by government or DFO um, was immediately called off. Um, I happened to be in the office of the organization at the time and worked with people in my in that office and we contacted the First Nations chief, his office directly. We were able to continue that meeting. We put it together so that both sides could come together and talk and understand each other's position so much better. And out of that became the Fraser River Peacemakers organization that has worked for years to better understand the different positions of the fish harvesters on that river. And there has been, to a great extent, peace compared to what was there before. Do you, I, I quickly ask both of you, do you both, or either of you feel that this is what 
may be part of the solution in this situation. Thank you. Um, it, largely fishers, uh, Mi'kmaq fishers and commercial lobster fishers are not interacting. That's, that's pretty much how it's been. If negotiations are going on government to government, nation to nation, they're, they're largely being excluded from those discussions. Um, there, there's so much tension right now that, you know, I'm, it'd be challenging to get people in a room, I think. I'm, no, I'm not sure. Um, but at the same time, we often had looked to DFO for support for having their conservation officers, you know, out there to support um, to support Mi'kmaq rights, to educate the industry on Mi'kmaq rights. And that hasn't happened. Uh, it hasn't happened for us in Salmon, and that's something we, we still pursue on an annual basis. So, um, you know, I'm mildly optimistic. I would I would say that that, that might be uh, a way forward, but um, I think there there definitely needs to be a, a calm down period. And I think some constructive communication is needed between the two groups. Um, some sharing of information, uh, definitely some education on what's going on and what's being harvested and how many people are out there. And uh, you know, it's it's not right for anybody to take uh, matters into their own hands. And uh, cutting traps is 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 the opposite of conservation. You know, people need to now harvest more to 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 make to get capital to replace that capital cost that they have have struggled to put together. So it you know it's it's not um, it's not a good position to be in for sure. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Denny. Uh, Mr. Arnold, your time is well past. Uh, now to Mr. Morrissey for two and a half minutes or less, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. My first question is to uh, Ms. Denny, and I appreciate it if you could give me a short answer uh, because you spoke about the uh, conservation uh, aspect. Uh, I'd like for you to comment on the, the over the past 40 years, the management practices that have put in place in the fishery boat on the structured seasons as well as uh, legal size limits of lobsters has led this industry to be uh, very uh, lucrative, very valuable today. What would be a primary reason or justification of moving away from that established management practice that has led this to be a very, very valuable fishery in Atlantic Canada? Could you give me a quick response? There really isn't too much movement away from that other than the use of different seasons. Fishers out cannot be on the water at the same time as commercial fishers. They're just, they'll just be outnumbered. They use much smaller boats, much smaller gear, and it's hard to tell who's cutting whose traps. At least in the off season, they have that opportunity to see who's out there and who's doing the damage. Um, a lot of the uh, conservation measures are adopted from the commercial industry. Mi'kmaq people are very good to white seers. We're very interested in promoting conservation and using tools that have been, that have helped the industry succeed. And they're they're oh, okay. That that's right. fine, Ms. <laughs> so you would generally agree that the those management measures that evolved over the past has been uh, positive to the industry and growing. Would be interest to uh, to uh, Mr. Mr. Bernard. Uh, because there was a, a question earlier, Mr. Bernard, about the, about the inaction of this government. Could, would you, could you comment on, uh, there was a government in place before us for nine years. Uh, what was accomplished during that nine years, nine year period by the former conservative government? Mr. Bernard, you're on mute. Okay. Um, uh, there was actually no movement in my opinion, because, uh, over the, I was a part of the uh, the transition from PC to liberal. Um, there was some when they when we started talking about uh, treaty related measures and coming back to the table and trying to discuss uh, implementing of our, our rights. Um, there was really no movement there. Uh, there was uh, just enough to justify that there was contact made from government to the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. You know, um, but since uh, it really hasn't moved from really um, since I've been a part of this, uh, it is, it's gotten more structured and movement has been a lot more because the current court decisions, when it becomes a consultation and other stuff that, that are, that's being placed in, in our region. But it shouldn't have to come from the courts to express that. There should, be, there should have been an open dialogue many years ago and I think 21 years is way too long for anybody and okay. it's been both governments. Thank you Mr. Bernard, thank you Mr. Morsi. We'll now go to Madam Gill for two and a half minutes or less please. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. And I would like for us not to politicize the debate. I don't want to know who did something worse than someone else. I want to look for a solution. M Ms. Denny said many things that uh, spoke to me, ways that we can work better together, what the department can do better. And in your article in the Chronicle Herald, Ms. Denny, you said that the concept of conservation was instrumentalized or used politically by the department. Could you give me more details on that subject regarding what could be done better in your opinion? Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I mean, conservation is a tool now. It's just, a, it's a political tool to infringe on the rights of Indigenous people. It is one of the, the means that can, um, that government can use to infringe. So, you know, when you're working with conservation, there are, there are different ways to do things. And it, it's really not that difficult to imagine different ways of conserving. So that it doesn't have to be a one, one size approach for everything all the time. Um, and that goes back to that knowledge system approach where the, the values and beliefs are just as important. And, and when you do value conservation, but you can't agree quite how to get there, that, that is one significant challenge. Do I have any time left, Mr. Chair? Mr. President. Mr. Chair? 50 seconds. Uh, 50 seconds donc, uh, et... So 50 seconds. And could you please speak to us about uh, methods of conservation? I'm curious about your values and your knowledge, because we can also learn from you as a committee to know how to better solve the crisis and this stalemate. Could you speak more to us about those uh, values, Ms. Denny, please? Yes, it's important to have values that are that are shared between perspectives, such as the ability to be involved in fisheries governance. We see the Mi'kmaq being very having this willingness and desire to to uh, initiate their own fisheries governance uh, plans and and, and opportunities. Um, but it's also, we have to understand that we're not going to have the same values coming forward and we need innovation to address them. So we need to know what those perspectives are and what those values are and what's really important to those perspectives in order to move forward. Okay, thank you, Madam Gill. Now to Mr. Johns for two and a half minutes or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our nation, our, our party respects the, the nation to nation process and, and dialogue and um, we think that's critical that that's uh, protected here. And we know right now that the minister's in, in talks with the Sebag and Agity. Um, uh, she said she won't negotiate in public. We, we agree that that's the right course. Um, we're sitting here studying this issue that is ongoing. While the most important parties are in active uh, discussions, Th this question, Ms. Danny, maybe you can help uh, me with this. Do you have any concern at your end by the committee that these can undermine uh, these discussions? I'm not, I'm not sure if I can answer that. Um, they need these discussions need to happen, um, and if those who are doing the negotiations, hopefully, they're well informed and have those processes in place to make sure that they are well informed. Mr. Bernard, do you have anything uh, to add on that question? Being that you've been in politics, so. Um, there's always a need for dialogue in, in any in any place. Um, that's that's how our country was formed. Um, there has to be gives and takes in, in everything that we do. Um, and I don't really think that, you know, what we're doing here is going to impact any of that because uh, we are a nation. Um, you know, uh, in Mi'kma'ki. So we, we take care of each other, whether it's a big negative or other communities like Member 2, like Cogmore, or Sony. Um, it'll affect everybody at the end of the day because uh, I hope, I would hope that if there's any implementation of anything that comes down to uh, uh, how we practice, how we do our fishing, it, it goes right across the, the whole nation of Nova Scotia. Mr. Bernard, can you talk about um, your feelings around the definition of a moderate living and uh, that that should be in the, in the, the responsibility of the Sabaganagadi to define? Would you would you agree? Twenty seconds. Um, 
it's pretty hard to actually talk about uh, something that you're not really aware of. Uh, a moderate livelihood, I think, would be I would be end up in a lot of trouble if I tried to define it myself. Um, yeah. you know, as okay. an I, mean, I wouldn't. Would you just put it back to the the the, the nidugulam in terms of the principles is embodying that? Oh, well, nidugulam would would seriously have a, a whole impact on this. Um, you know, you, you Mi'kmaq won't go out there to to get rich. Uh, we don't have a lot of rich people around us because we share our resources with everybody. So uh, you're not going to see that. But you do need people out there practicing a moderate livelihood to make a, a decent living for their family outside of social assistance, really. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johns. Your time is up, and I believe you're leaving us now after this one, and your replacement is already in place. Mr. Vakrak is there. I want to say thank you to our witnesses again who have appeared in the first, uh, I'll say, hour of our uh, committee meeting this evening. Thank you for your time, and uh, your testimony was very valuable, and I sure will help finishing off our study when we get there. Uh, again, we'll suspend for just a moment to let the witnesses leave and uh, we'll get the other three witnesses or no.
When you are ready to speak, you can click on the microphone icon to activate your mic. A, rem a reminder that all comments should be addressed through the chair. Interpretation in this video conference will work very much like in a regular committee meeting. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor, English or French. When speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. And when you are not speaking, your mic should be on mute so as we don't get any feedback from any other noises. I would now like to welcome our witnesses in the second panel. We have, of course, Mr. Sproul, President of the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association, from the Recoupement des Pêcheurs Professionnels du Sud, Sud de la Gaspésie. We have uh, Madame Kenney and also Mr. Cloutier. Uh, we'll now go to the speaking for the witnesses, and we'll start with Mr. Sproul for five minutes or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, committee members. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. The members of the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association are grateful for this opportunity to voice our concerns. The association represents nearly 200 family fishing businesses along Nova Scotia's Fundy Coast. For 30 years, we have advocated for sustainable practices and community-based fishing management. We have been a leader in peaceful coexistence between non-Indigenous and First Nations fishers, and we have a long history of cooperation with governments and regulators at all levels. This has given us a reputation as a valuable ally on ocean issues. Needless to say, our members are proud of their legacy as progressive fishers who embrace a different way of doing things. We are all committed 100% to preserving our way of life for future generations of Nova Scotians. I came here today in defense of a 400-year-old, truly sustainable way of life. Last year, the fishing industry exported well over $2 billion worth of seafood from Nova Scotia. We are not a quaint cottage industry. Fishing is the economic powerhouse of this province. It employs 26,000 people directly and 26,000 people indirectly. That makes our industry the largest employer outside of the public sector in Nova Scotia today. But these numbers do not tell the whole story. What's important to understand is how that $2 billion is delivered as a diffuse economic benefit into some of the most isolated communities in Nova Scotia. This is truly a lifeblood of our economy and the only bulwark between the current prosperity enjoyed in many coastal communities here and the drastic economic decline evident elsewhere in rural Atlantic Canada. The fishing industry did not get to this stage by happenstance. It is due to hard work, respect for the environment and the application of the precautionary principle in fisheries management. We have taken care of our inshore fishery and now it is taking care of us. The Bay of Fundy supports indigenous fishery access rights and we condemn explicitly all acts of violence in the fishery. This begs the important question today, why have we suddenly found ourselves in a conflict recently when we have had 21 years down the road of mutual peaceful coexistence. In my great grandfather's day, he fished from our small cove on the Bay of Fundy in peace and coexistence with African Nova Scotians and Mi'kmaq fishers. We all had something in common, a reliance for and a respect for the sea and its bounties, and most importantly of all, extreme poverty. Since that time, Terrible things have been done to Mi'kmaq fishers by colonialism and by the government effectively dispossessing them of their right to fish. My grandfather and the others who shared the cove didn't do that to indigenous people. The government did. And we should all accept that this is still the case in the present conflict. The problems in St. Mary's Bay have been caused in Ottawa, not in our fishing communities of Nova Scotia. This division is being driven by just that, division in its own right. I have spent my life fighting for social justice for fishermen, regardless of heritage. The government's attempt currently to divide us for political reasons are at the core of this conflict. All of our communities, both indigenous and non-indigenous, rely on one lobster resource, and the lobster does not care who catches it. What's really at the height of the current, at, at the center of the current crisis in St. Mary's Bay is sustainability. 
Lobster landings during the last three years have declined by 65% within St. Mary's Bay, while they remain strong across the wider lobster district and across Atlantic Canada. What this evidences is, is, is how important it is for all people who participate in commercial fisheries to operate under one set of rules. During my youth, I witnessed the horrors of what happens when politics enter fisheries management. What happened was the total extermination of ground fish stocks on the Scotian shelf, and it had horrible consequences for all communities in Nova Scotia. Subsequently, the lobster industry has been managed with an organic set of management procedures developed by the industry for the industry. And its outcome has been an incredibly lucrative, well-managed fishery. Currently, I see the re-entry of politics into fisheries management in Nova Scotia. And I don't want those outcomes for my community and I don't want them for indigenous communities. All of the remedies for fishermen on both sides of this equation are evident in the Marshall decision as it stands. We must all respect the Marshall decision in all of its parts and apply it to achieve peace in Atlantic Canada. I would draw your attention to section 40 of the Marshall clarification, which clearly says, and I quote, the paramount regulatory objective is conservation and responsibility for it falls squarely on the minister responsible, not on the Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal user of the resource. Full stop. Thank you, Mr. Sproul. Uh, time is up. Oh, uh, thank you. We'll, we'll now go to... Yeah. We'll now go to our other witnesses uh, for their opening statement. I don't know if both of you are speaking for the five minutes or if you're just one of you are going to deliver the opening remarks. Mr. Cloutier will be speaking. Good. Okay, Mr. Cloutier, for uh, five minutes or less, oui, please. Yes, hello. We will be sharing the time between both of us, and we'll make sure we don't go over the five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, dear members of the committee for agreeing to hear the testimony of the 148 commercial lobster fishers from Gaspésie, represented this evening by the Southern Gaspésie Coalition of Professional Fishers, or the Coalition. My name is Onine Cloutier, Director General of the Coalition. I'm also President of the Quebec Fishers Association and Secretary of the Federation of Independent Fish Harvesters of Canada. And I'm also a professional owner-operator since 1983. My colleague, Claire Quenet, is in charge of projects at the Coalition. She is a graduate in French law and has a university degree in conflict resolution. She has practiced as a lawyer and facilitator in New Zealand. We will send you, within the next 24 hours, our detailed written testimony. The Coalition's mission is to ensure the sustainable development of the fishery, by maintaining a balance between the economic needs of inshore fishers in southern Gaspésie and the sustainability of the species they rely on, particularly American lobster. On December 13, 2019, a mandate was given to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard to pursue and accelerate reconciliation with First Nations. With the First Nations, yes. In this context, the process followed by the DFO or from by the minister, raises fundamental questions regarding the way in which the fishing activities are managed, access to the resource for all, the sustainability of stocks, and the economic balance of coastal communities that depend on fishing. The current violence is a symptom of a flawed negotiation process, followed by the government and its constant exclusion of commercial fishers from fisheries management discussions. The government's approach divides coastal communities, all of which depend on fishing for a living. This is aggravated by the public and repeated use of violent terms such as disgusting, racist, terrorist, without mentioning that recent events come from a minority of fishermen and that the Atlantic Canadian and Coalition is member does not tolerate violence. The coalition has been calling on the DFO since October 30th, 2019 to put in place a dialogue and a communication process involving the First Nations of Gaspésie. 
and including the coalition and the DFO. To date, no feedback has been received from the DFO on this subject. To date, the coalition has never received a response from the DFO on the measures that were being discussed, nor has the coalition been consulted by the DFO on these measures. Any change in the measures of a conservation-based lobster fishing plan in favor of one group of fishers inevitably causes inequalities and tensions within the coastal communities that depend on the fishery. Since the 17th century, non-native coastal communities in Gaspisi have depended on lobster for food and income. The commercial fishing season lasts 10 weeks between the end of April and the end of June, during which time lobsters are not molting and a maximum number of egg-bearing females are released. It is during this period that the commercial lobster fishers withdraw part of their annual income. In 2013, the Senate Committee on Fisheries noted that since 2008, the lobster fishing sector has been facing unprecedented economic and structural difficulties. The Senate Committee considered that these efforts must not be relaxed. The lobster sector must stay the course and continue to make the changes necessary to ensure its stability and sustainability. Since 2006, the coalition has implemented multiple measures to reduce fishing effort by 30% and to rebuild the lobster stocks. It plays a central role in the conservation and sustainability of stocks to ensure that every lobster harvester First Nation and non-First Nation alike can continue to operate the fisheries on which we all depend in an equitable and sustainable manner. In 2019, the commercial lobster fishery in Gaspésie in areas 19, 20, and 21 represented nearly $45 million, which is 24% of the total landed value recorded in Gaspésie. According to public statements from Listigouche, the Mi'kmaq First Nations in Gaspésie earned more than 40 million dollars that same year. The DFO issued a total of 163 lobster fishing licenses in 2020 for areas 19, 20, and 21, including 58 for non-natives, 12 for three Mi'kmaq First Nations, and three for Vigier First Nation Malasite, Malasite. In 2020, this represented the equivalent of one lobster fishing license for every 610 non-native inhabitants of Gaspésie, one lobster fishing license for every 223 First Nations inhabitants of Gaspésie. Thank you. I will, I will continue if that's acceptable. Next, regarding the notion of moderate standard living, in 1993, Justice Taggart, in a decision of the British Columbia Court of Appeal, stated, Irrespective of its origins, in my view, the concept of moderate livelihood does not provide an appropriate or practical basis for articulating the scope and nature of Aboriginal rights, or the scope of Aboriginal priority to exercise those rights. The nation of what constitutes a moderate livelihood is inherently subjective, even if it could be determined how, and more importantly, by whom such a fluid standard could be determined. We're way over time for the opening remarks, uh, so we'll hopefully anything you haven't had said already will come out in the rounds of questioning. We'll now go to our first round of questioning for six minutes or less, Mr. Bragdon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be deferring my time and request it to Mr. Calkins. Calkins. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bregman. Thank you to the witnesses for uh, your testimony that's uh, here today. And uh, uh, Colin, if I may call you that, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to start with my first line of questioning with you. Uh, you uh, were very eloquent and articulate in what you had to say, uh, and I understand the uh, frustration uh, that you've had. Can you uh, just expand a little bit on the 65% decline in St. Mary's Bay and what that might be attributed to? Well, I, th I think first it's important to understand what St. Mary's Bay is. It's a, it's a shallow, warm uh, coastal bay that 
acts as a lobster molting and breeding ground. And during the warm summer months, lobsters gather there in incredibly dense concentrations. And and um, what it means is that when fishing takes place out of season, that, that the catchability of traps in, in that area is considered by many to be 10 to 1 compared to fishing during during the commercial season. And and even though we've seen the 65% decline in landings within St. Mary's Bay over the last three years, as compared to a 6% decline, uh, you know, across the wider fishing area, which is attributed generally to seasonal variability, the landings don't account for all the damage that's taking place by out of season fishing. And, and, and it's never appropriate to fish in a lobster breeding ground during the closed season because of that. The lobsters are soft shelled at that time and, and really susceptible to damage. And I've heard the defense that, that, um, you know, Americans fish year round for lobster, but I think if you spoke to any American fisherman, they would talk to you about the incredible strength of the lobster resource in Atlantic Canada and, and fishing them, during the season when it's most sustainable to do that is is a real uh, is really at the core of that as far as uh, lobster fisheries taking place at different times throughout atlantic canada they, they take place because of changing environmental conditions and lobster fishermen across the region harvest lobsters when it's most sustainable and when it's most profitable so you would argue that conservation if uh, conservation is the pinnacle then we need a rules-based system in order to uh, to uh, govern uh, when lobster are taken, how many lobster are taken, the season, the times, and so on. Um, because the, the previous testimony that we heard from Ms. Denny talked about an alternative governance model, uh, even though she didn't provide details uh, about that, and I'm not saying that as a criticism, uh, I didn't have a chance to ask her any questions, but she was talking about things such as a spiritual limit or a spiritual fulfillment uh, fish until that is fulfilled. How would you expect the Department of Fisheries and Oceans be able to uh, come to terms with both uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous fishers in, in that type of construct or concept? Well, I believe in those ideals and in Nagulamek when it applies to food, social, and ceremonial fisheries. But when we look at fisheries based on profit, that then we have the entry of non-Indigenous people into those as consumers of the product. And that's when that's when I see problems with, with fisheries management based on those ideals. Um, there's also the obvious fact that all Atlantic Canadian communities rely on one lobster resource, which has been managed through the concerted effort of more than 9,000 lobster license holders and a ton of a, a ton of science by the industry and and by government and a, and a and a commitment to precautionary principle management and sustainability that's built this that's built this into what it is. I think that it's really the heart of folly to think that anyone, no matter how good intention, could manage one lobster resource with 34 different sets of management plans as well as the accepted one. So, uh, thank you very much for that. I know that it's been, uh, I've been a long-standing member of this committee and we've talked uh, talked to a lot of fishermen over the years and I know that there's been significant investments uh, by the Government of Canada to assist uh, Aboriginal people to be enabled to uh, enter the commercial fishery in Atlantic Canada. Some of those investments would have been to purchase craft, uh, purchase of quota and so on uh, to the point that um, uh, I believe that the total on reserve fishing revenues for the Mikwa and Maliseet grew from about $3 million in 99 to about $252 million in 2016. Uh, I don't know if that number is accurate or not. Uh, is, it, is, um, is, there, is the growth that we've uh, been able to provide for uh, uh, Aboriginal fishers, um, in, in your opinion, uh, enough in order to satisfy uh, the... Um, uh, the ability or the the uh, the livelihood, the modest livelihood that they would have in a communal-based fishery if they were sharing that wealth. Well, what you're asking really begs the question: are, Why do Indigenous people still not have access to the fishery, given that the federal government, Indigenous communities, and delivering it to First Nations? And it's at the heart of this issue, and it's not being discussed. And what 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 the issue is is that a majority of that access is then leased, rented back out to non-Indigenous fishing corporations, effectively dispossessing First Nations people of their legitimate right to fish. As early as last month, Minister Jordan made clear that the government views the implementation of modern at livelihood rights through the communal commercial access program the transfer of access from it from non-indigenous communities to indigenous communities and 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 what i see is that some fishery indigenous fishery leaders in nova scotia are missing the true value of what the fishery is and it's not lobsters landed on the dock or dogs if i can then just extend that question to uh, our friends uh 
uh, Mr. Cloutier or uh, Ms. Kinney, uh, can you talk a little bit about what the, uh, has there been a similar type of uh, structure set up uh, for uh, the purchase of, um, purchase? Yes, in Gaspésie, a certain number of licenses were bought and by the uh, department and were given to the three First Nations present on the Gaspésie territory. These are commercial licenses. In addition to that, the Listigouche First Nation has the equivalent of one commercial fishing license for a moderate livelihood. And I would like to highlight that in the Gaspésie region, the fall period is a period when the lobsters have just reproduced. The females have not yet moved their eggs, so all females that are captured at that time, even if they have been fertilized, which would permit for the uh, stock to repopulate, are not fished. And I will pass it over to Mr. Cloutier. At a time for that particular question slot. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Batiste for six minutes or less, please. Yes, my question is for uh, Mr. Sproul. You've stated that Section 40 of the Marshall II states it is clear that the Minister of Fisheries can unilaterally regulate or infringe a treaty because of conservation. And, it, and it's odd because Donald Marshall Jr. fished out of season, sold his catch out of season, and the court found him not guilty not once, but twice because of the Treaty of 1761. So, Mr. Sproul, I'm wondering, have you read the other case law on Indigenous law that relates to treaty or just Marshall? So you would know that uh, in Badger, it talked about that in order to infringe uh, an Aboriginal treaty right, you first have to sh justify it through either um, safety or conservation. But Mikasu Cree in 2006 also stated that before you can even get to uh, infringement based on safety and conservation, you, that you have to show that the honor of the crown is met. And I'm wondering, uh, did you scroll down to section 45 of, of the Marshall decision, the five clauses after the one you said, where it said, the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal people of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. It is the obligation of the courts to give effect. To it's clear that uh, the that conservation and regulations can come from the minister. Well, two reasons. Once of all, first of all, we saw um, immediately post-Marshall the chaos that ensued in Burnshirts, New Brunswick, and that's what really drove the clarification in November of that year of the of the court, and 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 drives my focus on forty because it clearly showed that at that time that management needed to fall with the minister and and. And then the current minister moved forward, implementing the right through the communal commercial access program. The second part I'd say is that I agree with you that the government needs to pass the Badger test. The first part of that test is pre you know, is is real consultation, the real consultation process with the Mi'kmaq. What I would say in response to that is that for the people, but also because Indigenous fishery leaders refused to engage in a consultative process, literally putting a sign on the table that said, this is not a consultation, it's a negotiation. What I would venture is this, is this, is that for the government to be able- I was talking to the to the litigators today from Marshall, Eric Ziley and Bruce Wildsmith, and would you be surprised to hear that the Crown never once raised the argument or called any evidence the scope of the regulatory powers in the first Marshall case? Does that surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me. And, and I agree with you that the government has failed the Mi'kmaq people, and, but they've also failed so, the people in my community. And I Colin, think that- uh, this isn't about the government. This is about the law. So I'm, I'm wondering, you're quoting the law. So I want to know, uh, in Marshall too, it was actually the West Nova Fishermen's Association that brought this argument of regulatory powers. And in, in, sec in paragraph 31, it was pretty specific where it said, this question is not raised by the subject matter of the appeal, nor is it capable of being answered on the factual record? So the courts didn't even look or had no evidence or any kind of arguments about regulatory powers. So you keep quoting a part of the case that is legal dicta. Are you familiar with legal dicta? I'm not a lawyer. I'm a okay. fisherman. You're okay, because you, you've been quoting the law quite a bit. And I, and I want to just read off for you what uh, legal dicta is. It's the part of a judicial opinion which is merely a judge's editorialization and does not directly address the specific of the case at bar. So is it true that you've been 
using this legal dicta as the only source of 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 being able to say that the minister has a regulatory power over the Mi'kmaq, true or false? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I've certainly been saying that the minister has the regulatory authority here. That, that, but, that's but the definitely rule, my position. The case was pretty specific <laughs> that Donald Marshall Jr. not only once but twice was was told that he was not guilty because of a treaty right, despite fishing out of season, despite selling catch out of season, yet you say the law is clear. I'm what trying I, to figure out how. What I believe the real problem here is that is that it was or due to the fact that we have a, a one one nation's government and another nation's government dealing with this problem and that fishers have been left out of the equation on both sides all along. And, 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 I think, and so, Colin, you feel that the, it's the government's fault, but we are seeing vigilante justice, the cuttings of traps. Are, do you think that's a, a right way to handle this situation? Do you, I, uh, do you condemn the cutting of traps and, and what has happened in, in that area? I condemn violent acts of, of any kind and as well as sending any kind of fishing equipment to the bottom of the ocean. I don't think any sustainability-minded fishermen would, uh, would ever be advocating for something like that. And just so we're clear, you know, this pro the lobster resource, Mr. Batiste, can sustain all of our communities if we focus on sound management by the precautionary principle and not on politics. There's a bigger question here that needs to be answered, and it's that if moderate livelihood fisheries are intended to make money for Indigenous people, and, and, and that it's been accepted by previous witnesses that part of the reason for commercial seasons other than sustainability is marketability, why would it not make more sense to fish in the highly marketable season. Another way of looking at it is that the price that moderate livelihood fishers have been receiving for their catch this summer is somewhere around three, three fifty a pound in Canadian dollars. The the price that fishermen are receiving in open LFAs right now, where the lobster resource has transitioned into a high quality marketable product, is twelve dollars a pound. And if the people of Sagabagnadi left those trap left those lobsters in St. Mary's Bay in the water for another eight weeks, their value would increase fourfold. And I think that what's important to note is that Chief Sacks Nation possesses 15 commercial lobster fishing licenses to fish during commercial seasons in different areas within Nova Scotia. So I think that okay. the activity that's taking place there now is a bit of a double-edged sword for the people of his nation in terms of deriving an economic benefit from, from the industry. Thank you, Mr. Sproul. Thank you, Mr. Batiste. Your time has expired. We'll now go to Madam Gill for six minutes or less, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I think I'd like to take the tone down a little. We're here uh, at the committee to find solutions. And I think that in these uh, vigorous exchanges that we just saw, that there is some difficulty, maybe some frustration on one or both sides. And I think we're all capable of uh, rising above that in order to find solutions and to create a space that we discuss uh, to leave space uh, to uh, the other side with a capital O in the spirit of uh, negotiation, uh, openness and uh, respect, and of course, uh, giving credit to uh, the speakers. I know that uh, Ms. Uh, Kenne didn't have time to mention everything she wanted to in her introduction, so I will give her time and... Uh, with other witnesses. The subjects that interest me are uh, moderate livelihood and, of course, the whole matter of what the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans could do to facilitate negotiations and the resolution of the current crisis. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame Gill. Thank you very much, Ms. Gill. I also appreciate your uh, comments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. So, yes, we are in a forum that is there to be informative for all so that everyone can understand the situation that has all brought us here to uh, attend this Standing Committee on Fisheries during this emergency. I think it is important in the current situation for us to all have an open attitude where we can all look for solutions that are acceptable 
for everyone, considering everyone's needs. And speaking of those needs, the notion of moderate livelihood is extremely complex. It was left a little or even very vague by the jurisprudence, including in Marshall. And what does that cause today? It leads to interpretation and comprehension problems. The only thing that I could contribute today, and this has already been said, is that, yes, the notion of moderate standard of living is extremely subjective and it would be difficult to put in place. It has also been said that in order to determine a moderate standard of living, all resources available to a community should be taken into account. And so our coalition suggests the following. If such a notion were to be defined and could be defined, uh, if that e even is possible, it would be necessary to look at accesses to commercial uh, fisheries, access to a subsistence fishery, accesses to other sources of economic income, a private, uh, the households, tax advantages that might be distributed by the government, and other additional aid. In that context, I believe it is difficult to pay attention only to fisheries when we're talking about moderate standard of living. It is important to ensure that all Canadian communities, no matter their origin, have the same access to a standard of living. In Gaspésie, as in many coastal communities in eastern Canada, all communities are marginalized economically and socially. These communities all depend on commercial fishing for subsistence. And it is very important to have a dialogue on that subject. Inaudible for the interpreter. In paragraph 61... It was suggested in Marshall that the government may, by regulation, establish what a moderate standard of living means. The definition of moderate standard of living itself is not subject to the Badger test. And so if it is possible to de make this definition, the definition must take into account uh, we're dealing with a gray area here and a very complex concept. And uh, mutual comprehension is essential. Hey, uh, thank you, Madam Gill. And thank you for doing that so the witness could get that on the record. Uh, before I go any further, I will ask the committee members for unanimous consent that we extend enough to get this round and the next round in like we did last time for our witnesses. Okay, seeing thumbs up. Good to go. Okay, now I see Mr. Backwack has left us and Mr. Johns is back. Uh, good to see you, sir. You're up now for six minutes or less. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Great to be back. Uh, Mr. Sproul, as you know, in 1999, the Supreme Court clarified that um, a the, the, the paramount regulatory objective is the conservation of the resource. And this responsibility is placed squarely on the minister, not on the Aboriginal or, or non-Aboriginal us users of the resource. Can you clarify when this responsibility for conservation was officially transferred away from the minister and given to the fishers who have been cutting traps and stopping the Mi'kmaq from practicing their right to fish? It, it certainly has, has not, Mr. Johns. And, and what I would say to that is that it's... Um, I refer back to section 40, it's clearly not the responsibility of non-Aboriginal people to manage the resource. So how do you, how do you feel? That, do you think there's any way, there's any situation that can justify cutting traps and cutting fishing lines and destruction of lobster 
in the name of conservation. Can you think of any situation that could justify that? No, not sending lobster gear to the bottom of the ocean. I don't think that justifies conservation in any way. But it, what I here here's a what I think is the most important argument to make on it, and it's this: is that fishermen went to a closed lobster breeding ground and removed, um, untagged, illegally set under current Canadian law lobster gear, and brought it to the Matagan DFO detachment and, and placed it in the evidence locker. And all of that took place under the careful overwatch of hundreds of RCMP, Coast Guard, and DFO personnel, ships, and helicopters. And no charges were laid or any enforcement action was taken. And I understand that a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. So yeah, let's look at the... I think it's disgusting. And I'll can, give you the next question, Mr. Can I finish uh, my statement? Well, sure. If it's quick, yes. Yeah. So what I would say is that uh, a lot of people don't agree with that. So let's look at the other side of the question that Chief Sack came to Sonyaville and issued lobster licenses and set traps that, that aren't and, and issued tags that aren't covered under any existing legal framework, all under the same careful overwatch and that um, no enforcement action was taken against the chief or any of the moderate livelihood fishers either by the same people. So I think that no matter which side of that argument you're on, that we should all be able to agree that the onus is on Minister Jordan. And and the one I agree, thing that, I agree one it should thing, be on Minister jo Jordan, and which is disappointing that the fishers were pointing the blame at the the uh, the fish the indigenous fishers. They should have been pointing the, uh, the the finger at Minister Jordan. It falls on the government's feet. They have continually sent negotiators to the table without a mandate. They've dragged their feet in, uh, uh, you know, supporting the right to self-govern its rights implementation lobster fishery management plan, which is their plan, and they are implementing it. And it's currently discussing with Canada on the implementation of a nation on a nation to nation basis, which is the right form in terms of where, where that's, uh, you know, that conversation's held. Uh, do you support this current study of the standing committee must not undermine any discussions that the nation is currently having and, and engaged in with Canada? I think that what's most important to understand is that post Marshall 1999, this very same committee engaged in a study and in a set of recommendations to the House of Commons on how to implement moderate livelihood rights. And they, and they, you know, listen to testimony from a lot of people on all sides of the industry all across Atlantic Canada. I believe that the resolution to all of the issues here for both of our communities is evident in Marshall and its clarification. And I respect the decisions and would call on the government to implement Marshall. All of our solutions are already here. They just need to be recognized by the government. A key one for me is is a statement made by the committee, which was chaired by Wayne Easter, who still sits in the Liberal caucus. And this is what the committee recommended. As licenses are transferred to Aboriginal groups, particularly in the lobster fishery, a way must be found to prevent excessive localized fishing effort in order to avoid adversely affecting the health of stocks, particularly in sensitive areas such as spawning and nursery grounds. No greater fishing effort should be allowed than is already the case, including at a local level. And so we can see that a lot of these questions and problems have been explored 21 years ago, but right. not acted on. So it's funny that you bring up that study. Uh, you know, the committee presented a re that report on the Marshall decision and its implications for management of Atlantic fisheries back in December 1999. And that report found that DFO was caught off guard and didn't have a contingency plan, knowing that the Mi'kmaq fishers would be on the water and threatened by commercial fishers. We're sitting here in 2020 and Mi'kmaq fishers are still being threatened, intimidated. Traps are cut and a building has been burned down. In the last 21 years, do you get the impression that DFO has developed a plan to keep the Mi'kmaq fishers, uh, fishers safe when they're on the water or on the land, actually, as well? Or has DFO been caught off guard again? They've certainly been caught off guard again, but there's no excuse for it, Mr. Johnson. Here's why. is because, uh, as we've heard previous witnesses say from in, within Indigenous communities, they've been raising this issues, these issues with government for years, with successive governments, as have the industry. For three years, we've lobbied extensively, Minister Jordan and Minister Blair, and, and raised the public safety concerns. Let's be clear, like, what is really at the centre of this issue. Over the last three years, Justin Trudeau's cabinet, as a tactic at the negotiating, ta at the negotiating table, has stopped enforcing existing Canadian fishery policy and law because they don't want to sour the mood at the table. That lack of law enforcement is precisely what led to the chaos and the animosity between fishermen who have peacefully yeah. coexisted. But, but a, a committee is not nation to nation. I just want to underscore that. And you, you understand that, do you? Yes. And I've been clear in my statements that I think that the government should 
and certainly can have whatever nation to nation conversations that the nations desire. And I don't believe that we have any part in those. What I, what I believe we have a part in is conversations around the sustainability of the lobster resource that affect, you know, the long term sustainability of coastal communities in Nova Scotia. And there are precedents for the government to have nation to nation conversations and still take advice from the industry. North Atlantic Fishery Organization being the best example where the minister sits with other nations and, and directly negotiates. And in the side room, she takes advice from people from all parts of, of, of the fishing industry, Indigenous, non-Indigenous alike. Thank you, Mr. Jans. Your time is up. We'll now go to the second round of questioning. Mr. Calkins, for two and a half minutes, please, or less. Well, thank you, Chair. I, I believe uh, Mr. Mazur was going to take these questions. Uh, okay, time is taken. Mr. Mazur? Hello. Um, you can hear me? Everything's good? Good to go. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much to the presenters this evening. That This has been great. I'm, I'm from the prairies. I'm from Manitoba. And you talk about a fish out of water. This has been quite the experience and learning about all this. Uh, it, unfortunately, I've been watching in horror uh, th what's happening to your province and to your communities. Colin, I, 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 I could see the pain and the frustration that's going your community, you and your community are going through. And it's terrible to see that from a from a person that works the land myself. I I totally get where you're. Uh, I, I understand where you're coming from and and uh, and trying to protect your resources and uh, make sure that everything's sustainable. So thank you for that. Um, my question is for you: Why do you think this government is ignoring the situation? What has to be done? What do you think? Like it, what happened? Like how many years ago? Like we talk about 21 years, but this has certainly escalated here in the probably the last six months or even the last two, one or two months here. Uh, going after uh, uh, you know basically lobster that are going to be the next season, going after the golden goose basically. Uh, it, why why do you think the government is ignoring that? Why why do you think the minister is not acting, or what do you think is going on there? Well, I started to detail it earlier, really at the core of the problem is that the government has good intentions to reach rights reconciliation agreements with the nations. But um, the problem is that during the negotiations as a tactic, they stopped enforcing the law, but that only empowered people to keep fishing outside of regulations. And it's obviously been a failed tactic. And, and what we've seen come of that is 12 nations get up from the table and now one sit down. And I think that it's a, it's, it's a really obvious sign that, that things aren't, aren't working out here. Um, we also need to recognize the fishery access that's already existing in the communities. I want people in First Nations to be allowed to fish. I care about social, economic, and environmental justice for all fishers, regardless of heritage. But the current state is not producing Mi'kmaq fishermen. We need to change the process. And I, I'm, I'm really, what I find most immoral about what the government has done so far is that after mm -hmm. 21 years of no legitimate final reconciliation of these rights for Mi'kmaq fishers, they're only attempting to do more of the same. And it's only going to drive more division. Thank you, Mr. Sproul. Thank you, Mr. Mazier. Your time is up. Oh, we'll okay. now go to Mr. Cormier for two and a half minutes, please. Hello, bonsoir. Good evening. My question will be for Mr. Cloutier. Mr. Cloutier, I'm pleased to see you once again here at the committee. Could you explain to me why you are worried if ever a subsistence fishery for First Nations outside of the commercial season. Could you res summarize that for me as quickly as possible? I have to ask other questions. Hello, Mr. Cormier. It's a pleasure to meet you. In fact, at the uh, Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, we have always been told that it is one must not overdevelop a species and deny it a chance to reproduce. For a lobster, it is the same story. When it is during a vulnerable period, it's very clear we must not exploit that, that species. But in the Baie des Chalards and in St. Mary's Bay, the summer and fall season is the period for the lobster to molt, 
change its shell and reproduce. We believe that sustainability, or rather for sustainability, we need to ex we need to uh, abstain from fishing during those periods. Perfect. Thank you. So I am uh, very aware of my region when it comes to collaboration with First Nations, but can you tell me more about co collaboration with First Nations over the years in your region? Have uh, How First Nations have been included in fisheries and in conservation, for example, because I know in my region, a lot of collaboration has been done in a number of ways regarding conservation. How does this uh, play out in your region? We have uh, advisory committees. You know that we have three uh, First Nation and uh, Mi'kmaq Maliseet groups in our region. And we have advisory committees where rules were developed and adequate measures to develop the resource. Every year we get together and we sit around the table. And in 2006, we decided on a number of measures to uh, conserve the resource. Indigenous communities said yes, yes, we'll go ahead. And today they are enjoying the benefits of that. For 2020 and for our 2021 advisory committee, our committee decided to hand management over to an Indigenous group that volunteered to take it on. So the Maliseet group will be coordinating it uh, with the, the DFO. And it works very well. Thank you very much. Uh, your time is up. We'll now go to Madam Gill for two and a half minutes or less, please. Mm -hmm. Alors, Mr. Cloutier and Ms. Guenet, I would have liked to hear you speak more about conservation. I'd like your point of view, your ideas on the idea that they're on uh, resource management, on conservation rather, with the same objectives and perhaps the objectives can be different depending on values and principles for non-Indigenous peoples versus Indigenous peoples. In Gaspésie, I think we have all understood regarding Indigenous peoples that we need one uh, management model and that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans had to be in charge of that model. Well, one very simple reason is that we have three Indigenous uh, bands in Gaspésie Actually, we have four bands, and if they decided amongst themselves to each have their own self-management model, it would be very difficult to share the territory. And white uh, non-Indigenous fishers would uh, have to deal with these different types of management, so that would be very difficult. That is why we think that the DFO needs to take on that responsibility. Agreeing, of course, with the different groups. And I think that this is uh, going quite well and uh, being careful not to overdevelop the resource. It's very important to ensure the sustainable development of the resource. That's the best way to proceed. We are convinced of it. Est-ce que mon temps est écoulé, Monsieur le Président? Is my time up, Mr. Chair? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Perhaps for Ms. Kenne or Mr. Sproul, if you would like to add something that would be essential and urgent that we need to work on right now. Over to you. Thank you. If I may, what is urgent and essential is to find a process that is fair, that enables commercial fishers and indigenous peoples and the government to sit together to develop solutions accepted by all. Currently, the process followed by the government in fisheries management is directly responsible for the tensions we're seeing in southern Nova Scotia. So the priority really is to implement uh, in this emergency, an inclusive process for fisheries management and a mutual understanding of values among groups. 
we understand that uh, indigenous groups have ancestral knowledge regarding fisheries. And as a result, that must be taken into consideration and understand, understood by everyone. And it can only be done in an inclusive process. Thank you. Uh, again, over time a little bit. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Johns for the last question uh, period of two and a half minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Sproul, the Sabang and Agati are the second largest Mi'kmaq community in Nova Scotia and the largest community in mainland Nova Scotia, which I'm sure you're well aware. And they're a community that's been affected by centralization, oppression under the Indian Act, and intergenerational effects from residential school. The nation, their leadership has chosen to implement its 1960, uh, sorry, 1760-61 treaty right, uh, the constitutionally protected right in Supreme Court decisions. Given these colonial oppressions uh, that have suppressed uh, the Sebag uh, and Agati uh, people from entering the middle class society of Canada, do you support that the, the, the Sebag and Agati must determine themselves what a moderate livelihood is? First, I'd like to be clear that I accept the presence of systemic racism within Nova Scotia and its effects on Indigenous people and also the horrors of colonialism and, and how it effectively dispossessed the Mi'kmaq from rights, especially rights to fish in, in this case. What I'd say about, about um, defining moderate livelihood is this, is that it was deliberately left vague by the court because this is an issue to have been solved within the House of Commons and through negotiations with the nations. And I don't think that we'll ever be able to define a moderate livelihood, right? I think that it's vastly different in the lower mainland of BC than it would be in coastal Newfoundland, for instance. And 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 I think that what we need to do is 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 look do you, at... Do you agree that, it's that, that they themselves should determine that? I believe in the right in the Section 35 rights of Mi'kmaq people for self determination, but I also believe that when it comes you, to you natural, you believe that they should be, you know, that I'm, they should I, be able to assert their own Section 35 rights to self govern themselves with their own rights implementation lobster fishery management plan. I believe I, I'm trying to finish the question, sir, and I, and I believe that or the answer rather, I, I believe in 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 the right to Mi'kmaq people of self determination. But when it comes to natural resources that all people of Canada rely on, I think that the Supreme Court was clear after the chaos that that, in, that ensued in 1999 that it needs to be the minister that makes the decisions on management. When I say that, I say that with the acceptance that my members do not own the lobster resource in, in the Atlantic Ocean's waters. No one does. They belong to all Canadians. And that's why I think it's important that, that the minister, who, who ultimately needs to take the best decisions for all Canadians into her heart and into her mind, needs to be the one that makes the decisions. And, and I feel that it not only agrees with the Supreme Court, it also agrees with the majority viewpoint of the Canadian public, which we've which we've revealed through polling in August by Nanos Research that showed 79% of Canadians believe we should all be sitting at a table having these discussions together with the minister and 89% of Canadians believe that commercial fishing should only happen within commercial seasons for the benefit of all our communities. Thank you, Mr. Sproul. Thank you, Mr. Johns. That clues up our uh, rounds of questioning. I want to say a huge thank you to our witnesses for this portion of our uh, committee meeting this evening. Uh, I apologize to everybody for the lateness that we've kept everyone. Uh, even though I should apologize to myself because we're probably up the latest here now. It's almost 10.30 p.m. here in Newfoundland where I am, so <laughs> it's a little bit later than normal for committee. Uh, I'll just give a second now for the witnesses to leave. We have one piece of business that we have to look after, which should only take a moment. Thank you again to the witnesses. Difficult okay. that we're keeping you up this late, Mr. Chair. Oh, I know. I'm usually in bed before this, Bobby. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it was a very good meeting, though. I yeah, thought well, this was just when the pubs got rolling out there in Newfoundland. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a pubber. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, I, uh, it, it was, Mr. Morrissey, I think it was very interesting with uh, the witnesses we had this evening. So if, if Mr. It, uh, Chair? Yes. Let the, the witnesses are gone if you want to continue with the budget. 
Okay. Yeah, everybody, I think, was sent a copy of a proposed budget. Uh, I will remind everyone that has to be approved, and it needs to be approved now because, it, and it's only a preliminary budget, so as the, the clerk can start reimbursing people for travel or for time or whatever is involved to get the witnesses to appear. Uh, that, Of course, that amount may increase, and uh, they'll come back to us again if that is the case. So I'll entertain a motion, I guess, to... Uh, approve the budget as presented here this evening. Moved I by, so move, Mr. Chair. Moved by Mr. Morrissey, seconded by... I think I did. Mr. Cormier. Uh, hearing no discussion. All those in favour, maybe with a sign of a thumbs up or a no dissenting comment, I'll assume that it is passed unanimously. Thank you, everyone. I want to say thank you as well to the clerk and the analysts for uh, us running late this evening and being so cooperative with us all. Uh, once again, you're, you're, you're at our beck and call, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, see you all Monday evening for regular FOPO. Good night, everyone. <laughs>